Welcome to panel two, Defining the Nation and the Citizen Under Fascism. I am Preeti Chopra, the 2023 Suzanne Deal Booth Prize, Rome Prize Fellow and Professor of Architecture and Visual Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's my pleasure to introduce the, uh, the two speakers for this panel. Our first speaker is Hannah Malone, uh, who is Assistant Professor of Contemporary History at the University of Groningen and the Dutch Historical Institute. Professor Malone's work is deeply engaged with how politics shapes architecture and heritage. Professor Malone has written widely on Italian cemeteries, the cultural history of death, the First World War, heritage, memory, the fascist city, among other subjects. Her monograph entitled Architecture, Death, and Nationhood, Monumental Cemeteries of 19th Century Italy was published by Rutledge in 2017. She has another monograph under review with the title Fascist Italy and the Architecture of Death. Professor Malone has been the recipient of numerous prizes and research fellowships. This includes the Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship at the Free Universitat at Berlin, a junior research fellowship at Magdalen College, Cambridge, and a Rome Fellowship at the British School at Rome. The title of her talk today is Building Italian Identity in Fascist, fascist Ossuaries of the First World War. Excellent. Uh, bon pomeriggio a tutti. I hope you're ready to think about mortality. Now, um, the monument of Re di Puglia houses the remains of over 100,000 Italian soldiers who died fighting in the First World War. Built in the late 1930s, Re di Puglia is one of a group of ossuaries or bone depositories that were created by the fascist state. But at the same time, it's also a representation of Italian identity or of what it means to be an Italian citizen. Amassed within small niches, the dead served as models for the good fascist citizens and of, as icons of the body politique. So in this paper, I want to show how fascism reconceptualized citizenship in ways that had a major impact on Italy's political life. Now to do so, I will look at the fascist ossuaries as places where civic identity was both expressed and embodied. Now in this sense, the ossuaries are particularly interesting as they give material form to fascist ideas of citizenship. Now, my point here is that the regime promoted citizenship through various ways, but most obviously through the use of physical spaces. And the ossuaries are an example of a space that was built with the purpose of communicating fascist ideas of citizenship. Now, to unpack this topic, I will first talk about the historical context in which the ossuaries emerged, and then I will look at three aspects of fascist citizenship as reflected through the ossuaries. So let's start with some background on the ossuaries themselves. Now, originally, Italian soldiers who died during the First World War were buried in mass graves or in local cemeteries close to the battlefields. But in 1928, Mussolini decided to exhume and rebury the bodies of over 300,000 Italian soldiers who had died in battle. Now, you can see here on the left, 
how the bodies were disinterred. They were placed in these small boxes marked by tags under the surveillance of a priest. The bodies were then moved to the new ossuaries and roughly 30 new ossuaries were built along the former front lines in northeastern Italy and in present-day Slovenia. Now, this was, of course, a massive and expensive campaign, and its objective was primarily political. The ossuaries were meant to foster ideas of nationalism, militarism, but also citizenship. How did the ossuaries act as forms of fascist propaganda? Well, they were built to be sites of pilgrimage. The intention was that Italians would flock to these spaces to venerate the fallen. New railways and new roads were built to make these sites accessible. Large political ceremonies, such as those you see on the slide here, were held at the sites. Tours were also organized, especially for school children, for veterans, for fascist youth organizations. At the same time, the ossuaries were also promoted through newspapers, pamphlets, uh, photographs, and other means of propaganda. The political function of these ossuaries was cut short by the Second World War, which halted travel to these sites. But at least in intention, they were meant to be places which Italians would visit and where they might be inspired by ideals of victory and heroism and nationhood. Now, as I mentioned before, I want to focus on <coughs> three aspects of fascist citizenship. These are Italianness or Italianita, the relationship between the citizen and the state, and civic morality. And as I go through the three parts of this paper, I will explain what I mean by each of these things. Let's start first with Italianità, or Italianness as a component of citizenship. About a third of the ossuaries are placed in the northern Italian territories. These are new territories that Italy gained from Austro-Hungary as a result of the First World War. These areas are indicated in dark green on the map on the right. Now, it's worth remembering that in these areas, most men had fought on the Austro-Hungarian side rather than on the Italian side. So as symbols of Italian victory, the Ossuaries reminded the local populations that they had lost and that they were now under the rule of their former enemies. As you can see here, at the ossuaries of Rovereto and Caporetto, Caporetto, of course, being the site of Italy's catastrophic defeat in the First World War, the ossuaries were located high up on hills so they would dominate the towns below. Now, these locations were chosen explicitly as a warning to Italy's enemies as a monito alle nemiche rabbie. In 1919, the inhabitants of these new territories had gained Italian citizenship. Now, this was the first time that citizenship was granted on this scale to people on the basis of being born on Italian territory rather than having Italian parentage. So on the base of the jus solis rather than the jus sanguinis. Now, many of these people, as it's known, spoke not Italian, but German, Latin, Slovene, Croat. And for the fascist regime, this was a major problem. 
it was not enough for the fascists for these citizens to be legally Italian. They had to also become culturally and linguistically Italian. Now, hence policies of Italianization that imposed the use of the Italian language and which repressed non-Italian traditions within these areas. As markers of these new areas, the Ossuaries were part of these efforts to Italianize these new territories and to turn their inhabitants into Italian citizens. Now, these policies reflect a core characteristic of fascist citizenship. In order to be a citizen, you need to be Italian, culturally Italian, even ethnically Italian. Now, as Italianness becomes a requisite for citizenship, fascism associates civic identity with national identity. Now, as was mentioned previously by Stefania, citizenship draws boundaries. It establishes who belongs to the state and who does not. The fascist authorities wondered whether they should include the Austro-Hungarian dead within the new Ossuaries. Ultimately, they decided to restrict the Ossuaries to Italian citizens. In very rare cases where Austro-Hungarians were buried together with Italians, they were set apart and in monuments of minor grandeur. They're always referred to as the ex nemici, the former enemy. You can see that quite clearly here at the Austria of Montegappa. Here are the Italians. Down there are the ex enemies. Incidentally, the Ossuaries also had an economic value as they brought money to areas that were remote and whose economies had often been devastated by the First World War. Now, building firms run by Italians, Italian speakers from outside these new territories were brought in to build the ossuaries. Although Slavic speakers and no other non-Italian speakers were employed for very meager wages. So all this to say that Italians benefited disproportionately from the economic advantages of these costly projects. Sorry, I've lost a page. Oh, here it is. Moving on now to second point about the relationship between the citizen and the state. As stated in 1940, fascists redefined citizenship as the subordination of selfish private interest to the prevailing interests of the state. Now, of course, this idea of citizenship as a service to the state is not new, but it was very much brought to the fore by the regime. Now, this idea is also reflected within the ossuaries in various ways. Previous to the campaign of reburying the, the fallen soldiers, the commemoration of the war dead had been left to private associations, to local councils, to the clergy. But from 1928, it was forbidden to commemorate fallen soldiers without state approval. With the creation of the ossuaries, the state monopolized control over the dead. In fact, the ossuaries were built and administered by a military commission that still exists today, and that military commission responded directly to Mussolini. Uh, 
Now, this process of political concentration of power over the dead was paralleled by their geographical concentration. So, whereas before, the dead were scattered among a large number of small cemeteries, after the, uh, this campaign, they were concentrated within a few massive ossuaries. Now, to give you an example, the ossuary of Montello is quite small by comparison with some of the others, but it gathers over 9,000 bodies from 130 cemeteries in the surrounding area. Now, this concentration was done for practical reasons. It made visits and administration easier, but of course it also had political grounds. <coughs> Within the new ossuaries, the remains of the dead were reorganized following a fascist conception of citizenship. So, whereas the older cemeteries buried the dead individually in individual graves, the new ossuaries provided mass burial. You can see here on the left an image from one of the older burial grounds, the cemetery of Colle Sant'Elia, that was established immediately after the war in 1919. And you can see how the dead are placed within individual graves, each with their own marker or memorial. By the early 1930s, Mussolini came to see this cemetery as unsuited to the political needs of the regime, and he had it destroyed. The corpses were moved from Colle Sant'Elia to the new ossuary of Redipuglia, which you can see on the right. Now, in the new ossuary, rather than burial within individual graves, the fallen are packed into a vast monument. The fascist authorities stated that the niches should be as homogenous as possible. They wanted the names of the dead to be written in black on a black background to give a sense of that homogeneity. So there would be very little distinction between one set of bones and the next. Now, as a result, individual memories, the capacity to mourn individuals, is practically eliminated. And instead, we get a sense of the unity of the state, of a unified body politique. And this is again in line with fascist ideas of citizenship, whereby the citizen is subsumed, subordinated into the state. Moving on now to third section on civic morality. Fascism promoted a moral code or a set of values that citizens should follow. Now, of course, every political system has its civic virtues, but the fascists highlighted that citizenship for fascism had a moral basis, some fundamento mor morale. In other words, it was important that citizens followed specific moral values. Citizenship is not just a legal category, but also a moral category for fascism. Within the ossuaries, fallen soldiers are presented as models of civic virtue. Let me give you an example. At the Rossary of Montello, which was established in 1935, inscriptions covered the tombs of decorated soldiers and praised those soldiers for specific moral qualities. For instance, one soldier is remembered in these terms, and I've got the Italian on the slides, but I'll read it in English. An officer of evident virtue, 
who having learned that his battalion was engaged in an offensive, voluntarily interrupted his winter leave to run back to his position of honor and danger. And you see here a sense of self-sacrifice for the state. Another soldier is described in these words. Voluntarily enlisted, he took part in important actions always driven by great enthusiasm and love of the fatherland. A third soldier was described in these words. Repeatedly hit by a burst of machine guns, he fell gloriously on the field of battle, shouting, do not think about me, comrades. Always march ahead for the grandeur of Italy. As you see in these examples, honor, enthusiasm, love for the fatherland, a sense of self-abnegation. These are the qualities of a good soldier, but they're also the qualities of a good fascist citizen. The philosopher Giovanni Gentile identified as the principle of fascist morality, the subordination of the individual to the interests of the state. As figures who made the ultimate sacrifice to the state, fallen soldiers are the perfect citizens. They're the perfect moral exemplars for fascism. But how were these ideas of a civic morality transmitted by the Osrays? Now, I mentioned earlier that the plan was that Italians would visit these sites and be inspired to follow the example of fallen soldiers and to give their lives for Italy. In fact, one guidebook describes an ossery as a place of education, un luogo di educazione, where visitors are taught how the fatherland must be loved. In general, the ossuaries were described as having a moral content because they were meant to encourage moral imitation of the fallen soldiers. Now, for this reason, soldiers who were considered unworthy were excluded from the ossuaries. They were not buried in the ossuaries. Now, these could be either soldiers who had been executed because of desertion, or soldiers who died because of self-harm. Now, so soldiers lost their right to belong to the body politique. And we could draw a parallel here with the Leggi Fascistissime of 1925. That's literally the very fascist laws. Laws which stated that Italians could be stripped of their citizenship if they were deemed to be politically unworthy. Now, as a side note, the fallen soldiers offer a model for the male citizen, but there were also models for female citizens. As represented in this fresco at Re di Puglia, the ideal cittadina is she who sends her husband to war. Equally, as you can see from the quote, a book about Re di Puglia praised the unsmiling mother with dry eyes who is capable of saying to her son, go and accomplish your duty thoroughly. In time, fascism fell, but the Ossuaries remained. After the Second World War, they were preserved largely in an unaltered form. Having lost their original political function as instruments of fascist propaganda, they did not lose their political usefulness. Some of the ossuaries have been reinvented as national monuments and they're used today to accommodate state and military ceremonies.
As you can see here from these two images, some have been used in political campaigns, for instance, in the run-up to the elections in 2018. So in other words, the ossuaries are still places where civic identity is at play and where ideas of what it means to be Italian, who has the right to be Italian, continue to be renegotiated. So to wrap up, the ossuaries were spaces where the regime reworked the contours of citizenship. Fallen soldiers were ideally suited to embody the body politique, to represent fascist citizenship. They were symbols of Italianità. They were symbols of the subordination of the individual to the state. They were also exemplars of a civic morality. <laughs> it's hard to know what remains exactly today of fascist notions of citizenship. But undoubtedly, those notions have left traces from the Second World War up to the present. We might think about how citizenship has been rethought in the face of immigration, globalization, decolonization, um, some of which we spoke about today. I'd like to end with the words of the Italian president, Sergio Mattarella. Interviewed on the occasion of the centenary of the end of the First World War in 2018, Mattarella affirmed that under fascism, citizenship came to mean the supremacy of the state over the citizen, la supremazia dello Stato sul cittadino. But Mattarella said this need not be the case. And he pointed to other Italian traditions of citizenship, perhaps older traditions of citizenship as an alternative route to this fascist approach. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our second speaker is Roberta Perger, who is an associate professor in the Department of History at Indiana University, Bloomington. Professor Perger's research uh, researches and teaches modern Europe, particularly Italy and Germany, and about fascism and colonialism. Most of her publications focus on the connections between Italian fascism and interwar imperialism. However, they tackle a much broader range of subjects, including borderlands, citizenship, sovereignty, World War I, everyday life, hybridity, and migration. Her numerous publications include co-edited volumes, a monograph entitled Mussolini's Nation Empire, Sovereignty and Settlement in Italy's Borderlands, 1922 to 1943, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018, this book has been revised, translated into Italian, and published in 2020. She is currently working on a monograph entitled Italian Fascism and the Allure of, of Citizenship, 1922 to 1945. Professor Perger is the recipient of numerous prestigious fellowships and grants. They include fellowships at the Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton School of Historical Studies, the European University Institute, and the Eisenberg Institute for Historical Studies at the University of Michigan. The title of her talk today is The Duce Diaspora and Dual Identity: The Contours of Citizenship Under Fascism, 1926 to 1933. Thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to get started right away since we are running a bit late. So in early January 1926, moviegoers in Bergamo made such a ruckus at the showing of Rudolf Valentino's latest movie, Monsieur Bocquer, that the show had to be interrupted. 
we don't know how they felt about the movie, but what they were protesting was the Italian actor's application for American citizenship. Already in December, there had been calls for boycotts against the Divo following a short newspaper article that called Valentino a traitor for abandoning his Italian identity and adopting US citizenship. What Valentino had done in November 1925 was file the so-called Declaration of Intent. Naturalization in the United States was a two-step process that took a minimum of five years. After residing in the US for two years, an alien could file a Declaration of Intent, the so-called first papers, to become a citizen. After three additional years, the alien could petition for naturalization or file second papers. Valentino, ever defiant, fought, fought back against the accusation of being a traitor. In January 1926, he met with Italian ambassador Giacomo De Martino in Washington, laying out his reasons for applying for US citizenship, which, as he pointed out, were the same well-known consideration facing all foreigners who wanted to work and thrive in the US. A quote, pressures among professionals to naturalize, economic convenience, acquiring political rights, unlimited freedom to re-enter the US, et cetera, et cetera, end quote. At the same time, Valentino explained that the new citizenship would not inhibit him from feeling just as strongly his love and pride for his original homeland. As it happened, the new ambassador, he had not yet been in post for a year, very much agreed with Valentino's position assuring Italians who had become American of their old country's appreciation towards them so as to strengthen their ties to Italy was a cornerstone of De Martino's ambassadorial agenda. He stated as much in his address at a banquet in held in his honor as the new Italian ambassador in March 1925. Already before getting involved in the Valentino controversy, he had written to Mussolini to inquire whether he was authorized to state in an interview with the newspaper New York World that the new regime not only did not oppose Italians taking on US citizenship, but looked at them with approval. Mussolini, however, ordered the ambassador not to talk about citizenship as a new Italian law was in the making, and more about that in a moment. Six months later, in early June 1926, De Martino wrote to the Duce again, saying that if Italy wanted a progressive awakening of Italian consciousness among Italo-Americans, they needed to be told to be good and loyal citizens of the new country of adoption. Otherwise, Italy would encounter resistance among Italo-Americans and diffidence and opposition from public opinion and the federal authorities. To make his point and provide Mussolini with a template for future action, De Martino included an excerpt of a speech given by the Swedish crown prince on visit in New York, uh, who had stated that he was happy to see Swedish Americans use the Swedish language and at the same time be well versed in the English one in order to be good citizens and fulfill the obligations of American citizenship. De Martino mentioned the electoral power of the Nordic American citizens and then alluded to the recent discussion in the US Senate about an agreement on war debts and how that had given Italo-Americans an opportunity to express their concerns for their home country with their lawmakers. The Senate, uh, uh, alluded to by De uh, the, summit, the Senate discussion alluded to by De Martino was the Mellon-Volpi Pact which canceled about four-fifths of the massive debt uh, Italy owed to the US. No wonder then that De Martino hoped for ever greater pro-Italian influence in the US and thus openly lamented that many Italo-Americans had lost any kind of attachment to their home country. Not so Valentino, but to his dismay, the campaign against him continued. The anonymous author of that first article cal calling Valentino a traitor doubled down in January 1926 when he published a similar call to boycott Valentino in the Popolo d'Italia, Mussolini's paper, and, now, and by now the paper of government. Behind the signature from Boliere hit the journalist Luigi Freddi, head of the fascist party's press office. 
making fun of the most handsome man in the world, the article mocked a French article that reported on the crowds in Genova gathered before a movie theater to protest Valentino's American citizenship. In the classic country of art, so the French newspaper, fascism was causing people to lose their sense of beauty. Indigen indignantly, the Fromboliere replied that in the classic country of art, fascism was only causing people to lose their sense of cowardice and instead fostering the love of country, dignity, and courage. Valentino, of course, would not go quietly. He sent an open letter to the Italian press and to the American daily Il Corriere d'America. He telegraphed the Duce directly, and he corresponded repeatedly with Ambassador De Martino. The last letter was from June 1926, two months before Valentino's death. Writing to De Martino, Valentino again emphasized his honor and love of country. He was concerned not simply about the disruptions, calls for boycotts, public disturbances in front of movie theaters, the fact that he had been painted as a traitor, etc., but he took issue specifically with the article in Il Popolo d'Italia and what that meant for him. Valentino rightly identified the Popolo as the official paper of the fascist party and as Mussolini's personal mouthpiece. And with Mussolini in power, uh, he recognized this was now, the, as he put it, the official paper of the land. He wanted to know if the campaign against him had originated from the fascist party in Mussolini. And given that Mussolini was the representative of the state, he wanted to know the government's stance in order to determine how to move forward and what this meant for him. He wanted to fight this out, he claimed, because he always loved and would always love his fatherland with devoted affection. He trusted he could count on the support of the government and the Italian press to clear his name. Otherwise, he would have to rely on the American press and public opinion to safeguard his honor as a man and as Italian. In his open letter to the press, Valentino stated that his conduct was in line with Mussolini's remarks in Parliament, encouraging Italians living in America to form an integral part of that society. And Valentino reminded those who saw him as disloyal toward his country of birth that millions of Italians who became American citizens had devoted themselves to the development of the United States and to the glory of Italy. After corresponding with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and through them with the Ministry of the Interior, Ambassador De Martino assured uh, Rodolfo Guglielmi, the official correspondence refers to him by his birth name, that the police had intervened in the earlier demonstration and that if needed, it would do so again in the future. And Ambassador um, De Martino also suggested that in the subsequent months there had been no further disturbances uh, in front of movie theaters. In the event, Valentino actually never got to file his first paper to become an American citizen and died in New York at age 31 on, in August 1926, uh, still an Italian citizen. I dwell on this on this case because it raises a number of points in relation to citizenship in the interwar period involving national sentiment, Italy's history of emigration, international relations, dual nationality, the state of citizenship legislation in Italy, and specifically the, fas the fascist stance and actions in this regard. By the mid-1920s, millions of Italians in the, in the US were in Valentino's position. For a variety of reasons, it made sense for many of them to naturalize. After the US 1924 Quota Act, the pressure became even greater, so much so that uh, Italians living in the US were unsure of their position and were inquiring with the Italian embassy whether in order to remain in the US, they were, oblig uh, they were obliged to become US citizens. As Valentino's explanation for seeking US citizenship reminds us, emigrants tend to think in pragmatic terms and their decisions about national affiliation tend to be mot motivated by such considerations as employment opportunities, the ability to move freely, 
the requirements for becoming a resident, the need to be accepted in a host society, and so on. By contrast, states often think in, ter in terms of loyalty. The vantage point of the two sides were often difficult to reconcile, and yet, as De Martino's stance has already intimated, not impossible. For both the arguments with which Valentino justified himself to the Italian authorities and the stance taken by Ambassador De Martino, welcoming the fact that Italian citizens in the US were naturalizing in large numbers, reflected a new, a new thrust in Italy's approach to citizenship which emerged in the late 1800s and established itself by the early 1900s. And this new thrust is particularly evident in Italy's first comprehensive citizenship legislation after the political unification of the peninsula. Passed in 1912, the new citizenship legislation responded above all to the reality that millions of Italians now lived overseas. For instance, by 1921, Italy's population was around 40 million and over 9 million Italians were living abroad. And thus, because of this massive uh, number of Italians abroad, the authorities sought to, to, uh, ways to maintain the bonds between the expatriates and the mother country. Building on the 1965 civil code and early emigration legislation, law 13 June, the law from 13 June 1912 number 555, reaffirmed Jus Sanguinis as the main determinant of Italian citizenship. That meant that the children of the, of the millions of Italians who had emigrated would continue to be considered Italian citizens. The law also spelled out the basis for the renunciation, revocation, and reacquisition of Italian citizenship. And it was these elements that were of paramount importance for the emigrants. Under Italy's 1865 civil code, persons who became citizens of a foreign country, and even those who worked for a, for a foreign government, which might, say, take the form of workers building a, a railroad on behalf of the state, automatically lost their Italian citizenship. According to the 1912 law, however, Italians lost their citizenship only if they made the deliberate decision to acquire another citizenship. If a state declared them as naturalized by fiat, they would not lose their citizenship. When their children born abroad acquired citizenship uh, uh, of the birth country by default, following you solely, they, they, did not, they did not lose Italian citizenship either. Rather, such second generation children continue to be considered Italian citizens. They had the option of renouncing it, but only when they achieved the age of majority. If they did not do so, they would presumably retain both their Italian and their birth citizenship. Um, and for those who did renounce Italian citizenship, the new legislation made it very easy to reacquire it. All the, ret all the returnees had to do was to live in Italy for two years. Incidentally, there is an interesting paradox here. For dual citizenship or dual nationality, as it was termed in international relations, was considered a problem to be avoided at all costs. The increased nationalism at the turn of the century, and even more so after World War I, made states ever more determined to hold on to their citizens. Legal scholars and politicians railed with increasing vehemence against dual nationality. Yet, dual nationality was the inevitable result of competing citizenship modalities of use sanguinis, preferred by European countries with large diasporas, and use solely, adopted predominantly by countries of immigration. And as we have seen, the 1912 legislation contributed to the creation of ever more dual citizens, not less. The new legislation, in fact, signaled a new attitude towards the emigrants on the part of authorities. Already while the 1912 legislation was being drawn up, the discussion of emigrant status, as Sabina Donati and others have shown, revealed a new tone, one that valued the emigrants and made an effort to understand their choices. 
The idea was that immigrants would eventually have to naturalize if they wanted to thrive, and that their children would often be born citizens of the new country of residence. Italian citizenship law had to respond to this reality if it wanted to ensure the immigrants' continued loyalty and interest in Italy. And it thus had to be framed in such a way as to encourage pro-Italian sentiment. That sentiment, rather than legal citizenship per se, would, it was hoped, make all the difference in tying these lost citizens to their original homeland. In other words, Italianità was now being understood as something detached from legal citizenship, an underlying sense of affiliation that might flourish even if the holder was a citizen of another country. Thus, liberal Italy was seeing emigrants not as wasted or lost, but as a key resources, not least in identitarian terms. When, when Valentino insisted on the value he had to Italy as an American citizen, that his heart was Italian while acknowledging that it made pragmatic sense for him to take an American citizen, citizenship, he was very much speaking the language of liberal Italy. The schizophrenic attitude towards citizenship in the 1912 law, however, is revealed by the fact that when Italian men renounced their citizenship, they were still liable for military service in Italy if they had not, if they had not yet uh, completed, not already completed it. The argument was that it would deter people from going abroad simply to avoid military service, service. But it of course meant that at any given time, the Italian army would include men in its ranks who had explicitly declared their allegiance to another state. Paradoxical though this was, it helps explain one of the accusations leveled against Valentino, namely that he was a deserter, uh, failing to perform service he owed to the nation. As part of his citizenship, his American citizenship application, and to dispel rumors that he had failed to enlist in World War I, Valentino presented his discharge from the Italian armed force, forces for health reasons. What this article in the 1912 citizenship law meant in practical terms was that if they traveled to Italy, naturalized American citizens and American-born dual American-Italian citizens were liable for military service. It is against this background that Ambassador De Martino wrote, wrote in April 1927 to recommend to Mussolini a new policy on military service. He pointed out that the Italian-American community was changing its character. U.S. quotas meant that immigration had nearly ceased. The 1924 Quota Act had laid down a future immigration quota of just 4,500 Italians per year. And while those who were already there were seeking to elevate themselves in American society, it was inevitable that with time, these people's ties to Italy would weaken. The knowledge of the Italian language would diminish. The memory of Italy would move to a more sentimental plane. And the danger was they would be increasingly absorbed into American life and would be lost as a force for Italy and thus would no longer serve the needs of Italian foreign policy. Conditions to do something about this were currently very favorable, though, uh, uh, De Martino argued, since young people were now no longer ashamed of being Italian and were actually curious about their home country and proud of it. They also wanted to travel there and visit it. And as Martino, De Martino pointed out, this desire had to be supported and encouraged as the visitors would renew their ties and come back with uh, sort of a greater sense of attachment. But he, um, he also remarked that they were worried that once they would arrive there, they would be arrested for not having done their military service. And thus, uh, De Martino claimed Italy would not only lose tourists, which was in itself perhaps a small issue, but it would lose the opportunity to renew its ties to these Italo-Americans, and he claimed this was an incalculable damage. Besides, he pointed out, Italo -Amer it Italian Americans considered these sanctions for missed military service as a violation of the new status as American <coughs> citizens. And these sanctions also led to complication with the American authorities. They considered uh, 
these emigrants to be US citizens who no longer had obligations towards their countries of origins. And hence, Italian demands for the military service was seen as an interference in the rights of US citizens. And De Martino here uh, cited a claim made by um, US ha uh, House of Representative Congressman Kelly from Pennsylvania, namely that since the end of World War I, over 1,000 Americans had had to serve in the Italian armed forces. In his district alone, over the last eight to nine years, 50 Italo-Americans had been detained. So <clears throat> De Martino felt that the government had to think about this problem and uh, try to ob ob um, obviate such uh, um, situations in the future. Um, American public opinion, too, uh, very much uh, raised this issue and, um, and wrote about these incidents under Mussolini's regime, which I, qu I quote here from a Harper's Magazine article, tried to bring back to Italian citizenship all those countrymen who have been legally denationalized. Um, Italy was, however, walking a very tight line here because on the one hand, it wanted to claim these citizens, but on the other hand, it was also very much beholden to the US because of its reliance on US investment and loans. Meanwhile, though, as Mussolini had uh, uh, intimated uh, with Ambassador De Martino already in 1926, Italy was working on its own citizenship legislation. And in 1930, Minister of Justice Alfredo Rocco presented the regime's first comprehensive citizenship bill. And while the bill confirmed many of the 1920 and 1912 articles, it, it incorporated uh, some uh, major innovations, and one of which was the requirement that um, people who wanted to shed Italian citizenship would have to get uh, government consent. So in other words, people would no longer be able to give up the citizenship, but would actually need permission from the Italian government to shed citizenship. And obviously what this meant is that the number of dual uh, citizens would increase, would be increased further still. But as um, Minister of Justice Alfredo Rocco, who presented this bill, argue, uh, you know, he said, it is evident that a country with millions of sons abroad cannot continue to throw off its citizens to recognize, comply with, or even favor the politics of states who tend to enrich themselves with citizens at the expense of demographically stronger countries. Right? The bill was discussed in the Senate, but it was not made into law. And a similar bill was presented again in 1933, and again not made into law. Now, it is, I do not, I cannot speak to why these bills were not made into law, um, because the parliamentary papers that discuss this law uh, are not as rich, obviously, as the parliamentary papers uh, referring to such discussions during the liberal period. But I want to just offer uh, two reflections here on, on um, whether these bills uh, betray a fascist approach to citizenship. So in many respects, as I, as I uh, already mentioned, um, they confirmed what liberal Italy had already done. So they confirmed just Sanguinis and they confirmed uh, 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 the centrality of a blood lineage in defining the national community. Um, however, the liberal state had allowed for some free choice in renouncing Italian citizenship. And that is lost in the fascist, with this fascist proposed bill, which however never went uh, into, into effect. And I do think that that is a very important difference here because it points to the ways in which um, liberalism on, 
liberal Italy to some extent was beholden to the idea that citizenship is itself a right and that the citizen had a right to decide uh, where he or she wanted to belong, uh, which is something that, that fascist Italy um, wanted to do away with. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent presentations. Um, I think we have time for five minutes for a few questions. Um, Elisa, yes. Please. I have a question from the Zoom, so someone online from Martina Caruso. I'd like to thank Hannah for your super interesting talk and wondered if you knew anything about the history of the photographic museum at the top of the Redipuria monument, how it was put together, when and to what purpose, and since it humanizes the anonymous soldiers and seems to do the opposite of the monument. Also, I wondered whether the families of the soldiers were informed of the translation of the bones or invited to the inauguration of the monuments. Thank you and congratulations, Martina. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks Martina. I'll try and answer that very quickly. Uh, the, museum, uh, the museum at the top of Redipuglia collects objects that were taken in large part from Colle Sant'Elia, from the older cemeteries. So they represent an older form of commemoration that is much more individualized, that is, to some extent, pre-fascist. Pre um, so that explains why it focuses more on the individuality of, um, of the soldiers. And also that museum was redone in the 1990s, so it also has a contemporary uh, form. I've not completely, oh yes. Uh, were the family members informed of the translation of the soldiers? Um, they knew about it, but their consent was not sought. Um, some families did complain, but these tended to be you know, families with economic and political power that were able to write to the newspapers and be heard. Um, it's always hard in the context of a dictatorship to <coughs> find evidence for resistance. Uh, by the very nature of a dictatorship. Uh, but what I thought was particularly interesting, uh, reading in the archives the material about the translation of the bodies from the older cemetery of Colle Sant'Elia to the new ossuary of Redipuglia, that the authorities decided to put up a big fence around the whole area so no one could see what was happening and to completely level Colle Sant'Elia so no trace would remain. So to essentially screen the whole process. Now after the Second World War, Colle Sant'Elia has now been transformed into a remembrance park. But at the time there was very much a desire to shield uh, the families from what was happening presumably for fear of, of protest, of resistance. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yes. uh, thank you, this is also a question for Hannah. Um, so, um, I mean, clearly the cult of the dead was very extensive throughout fascist Italy, but as you said, this has a particular charge in the border area, in the, in the former battle zone, um, the front of the war. And I'm wondering, thinking about that regional story, because it is kind of a bonifica nazionale um, that has other parallels, but I wondered if you had thought about other regional um, spaces of commemoration, like the Paco della Remembranza in Trieste, which was mm -hmm. built, I think, in 26, mm -hmm. or even something like the Faro della Vittoria in Trieste, which is a more triumphalist kind of, you know, but also the position on the, the promontory, the kind of domination of space, and how that might compare. And then I just wondered, if you know anything about what happened in the period of socialist Yugoslavia to the sites that became part of Slovenia. I mean, I know there were, I think, reciprocal mm -hmm. protections, but in terms of kind of local usages around those spaces, um, it's, it's fascinating to think after the contestation over that territory after World War II, how those spaces were seen by people in Slovenia. Thank you. Um, let me try again to answer that uh, quite briefly. There are many comparable symbols of 
fascist power and fascist victory, Italian victory within the new within the new territories. Um, I mean, Largo della Vittoria in Bolzano, the Faro in Trieste. So many examples. And I think about if you think about where they're situated geographically, they're often placed up high, so they're very visible. You really. <laughs> cannot avoid seeing them on a daily basis. They occupy space and are very much in the face of the new inhabitants. Um, that is not exclusive to the new territories. I mean, the Osario Genicolino down the road, um, again, not in the new territories, but a, a fascist monument commemorating the dead, dead from the Risorgimento, is also given quite a prominent location and quite nicely um, high up. Uh, but there's certainly parallels with other forms of commemoration. Yes, the history of these monuments, um, when they became part of Yugoslavia, is really interesting. I mean, uh, uh, Gaetano Dato wrote a whole book on what happened to Redipuglia, which looks at how Redipuglia became a monument where um, it, Italian activists wanting to return to Italy protest. It was attacked by uh, Yugoslavian elements, seeing it as, you know, an, as it is, uh, a symbol of Italian Italian nationalism. So they're very very contested monuments. Uh, but what I think is quite interesting is that today the ossuaries um, in in Slovenia um, are very well kept and they're very well managed. And in fact, if anyone has occasion to go to Caporetto, which is now Kobarit in uh, Slovenia, um, they, they've created a wonderful museum that explains the context and the history of uh, the ossuary, but also of the Italian defeat, um, in, in a very sophisticated way. And this is in contrast to how the Ossuaries on the Italian side have been managed, where there isn't much critical preservation, there isn't much historicization or contextualization. The Kobarid Museum won actually some European prize because it is, it is very well done. It explains, it owns up to its fascist origins and explains Caporetto in a very even-handed uh, way. Uh, so that is interesting too. Um, I want to thank um Hannah and Roberta for their stimulating and exciting presentations. Um, we are a little out of time, but please, uh, at the drinks and dinner, please ask the questions that you've been wanting to ask them, so that keep the conversation going. And we'll have a little break here until uh, 6 or 5. Uh, then we have, yes, for our other keynote. Thank you so much. Thank you. And particularly if you had questions for Roberta that you didn't get to ask, we can come back to all of these questions. <laughs> Yeah.